What's good? It's your girl, Squeeze Jones, a.k.a. Killer Queen T, a.k.a. Black Eyed T, a.k.a. Dang, what have you been at, T? It's only been a day, y'all. It's only been a day. Blackout tea. Blackout tea. Okay, cut the light back on. It was not feeling good. It's crazy because the one day I wasn't, I, the one day I was feeling good, I didn't make a video. And then I came back on the day I made a video when I wasn't feeling good. Then I came back. I ain't making no video on the day I was feeling good. Then I wasn't feeling good today. And here I am. Anyway, we is on chapter nine. When Prince Darla sat up in his bed. Trying to remember where he was, whether he had been, and what he had seen the day before. He perceived that his room was empty. Generally, his nurse rather worried him by breaking his slumbers, coming in and setting things to rights, as she called it. Now the dust lay thick upon chairs and tables. There was no harsh voice heard to scold him for not getting up immediately, which I'm sorry to say, this boy did not always do. For he so enjoyed laying still and thinking lazy about everything or nothing that if he had not tired, if he had not tried hard to avoid it, he would certainly have become like those celebrated. Two little men who lay in their bed till the clock struck ten. It was striking ten. It was striking ten now, and still no nurse was to be seen. He was rather relieved at first, for he felt so tired. And besides, when he stretched out his arm, he found to his dismay that he had gone to bed in his clothes. Very uncomfortable, he felt, of course, and just a little frightened. Especially when he began to call and call again, but no one answered. Often he used to think how nice it would be to get rid of his nurse, nurse and live in this tower all by himself. Like a sort of monarch, able to do anything he liked. And leave undone all all that he did not want to do. But now that this seemed really to have happened, he did not like it at all. Nurse! Dear nurse! Please come back, he called out. Come back, and I will be the best boy in the land. And when she did not come back, and nothing but silence after his lament call, he very nearly began to cry. This won't do, he said at last, dashing the tears from his eyes. It's just like a baby, and I'm a big boy. Should be a man someday. What has happened, I wonder? I'll go and see. He sprang out of his bed, not to his feet at last, but to his poor little knees, weak knees, and crawled on them from room to room. All the four chambers were deserted, not for long or untidy, for everything seemed to have been done for his comfort. The breakfast and dinner things were laid. The spread, the food spread in order. He might live like a prince, as the proverb, proverb is, for several days. But the place was entirely forsaken. There was evidently not a creature but himself in the solitary tower. A great fear came over him, over the little boy, over the poor boy. Lonely as his life had been, he had never known what it was to be absolute to be absolute alone. A kind of despair seized him. No violent anger or terror, but a sort of patient dissolution. What in the world am I to do? Thought he, and sat down in the middle of the floor, half inclined to believe that it would be better to give up entirely. There we go. Okay. <coughs> Lonely as his life had been, he had never known what it was to be absolute alone. A kind of despair seized him. No violent anger or terror, but a sort of, sort of patient dis dis dislotion. Dis dis 
Solitution. What did Wally Lamata do, thought he, and sat down in the middle of the floor, half inclined to believe that it would be better to give up entirely, lay himself down and die. This feeling, however, did not last long, for he was young and strong, and I said before, by nature a very curious boy. There came into his head, somehow or other, a proverb that his nurse had taught him. The people of no man's land were very fond of proverbs. For every evil under the sun, there is a remedy, or there is none. If there is one, try to find it. If there isn't, never mind it. I wonder if there is a remedy now. And could I find it, cried the prince, jumping up and looking out the window. No help there. He saw only the broad, bleak, sunny shy plain, that is, at first. But by and by, in the circle of mud that surrounded the base of the tower, he perceived decently the marks of a horse's feet. And just in the spot where the deaf mute was accustomed to tie up his giant black charger, while he himself ascended, there lay the remains of a bundle of hay and the feet of corn. Yes, that's it. He has come and gone, taken a nurse away with him. Poor nurse, poor nurse, how glad she would to be gone. This was Prince Darlow's first thought. His second, wasn't it natural, was a passionate in, in this section at her cruelty, at the cruelty of all the war toward him, a poor little helpless boy. Then he determined, forsaken as he was, to try and hold on to the last, go ahead and stick it up so I can smack the shit out of you. And not to die as long as he could possibly help it. Anyhow, it would be easier to die here than out in the world, among the terrible doings which he had just beheld, from the midst of which it suddenly struck him. The deaf mute had come, contriving somehow to make the nurse understand that the king was dead, and she need have no fear in going back to the capital, where there was a grand resol resolution, and everything turned upside down. <coughs> So, of course, she had gone. I hope she enjoyed, miserable woman, if they don't cut off her head, too. And then a kind of remorse smoked him for feeling so bitterly toward her. After all the years she had taken care of him, grudgingly, perhaps, and coldly, since she had taken care of him. And that even to the last. For if I said, for as I have said, all his four rooms were as tidy as possible, and his meals laid out that he might have no more trouble than could be helped. Possibly, she did not mean to be cruel. I won't judge her, said he. And afterward, he was very glad that he had so determined. For the second time, he tried to dress himself, and then to do everything he could for himself, even to sweeping up the hearth and putting on my coals. It's a funny thing for a prince to have to do, said he laughing. But my godmother once said that princes never nip need never mind doing anything. And then he thought a little of his godmother, not of summoning her or asking to help him. She had evidently left him to help himself, and he was determined to try his best to do it, being a very proud and independent boy. But he remembered her tenderly and regretfully, as if even she had been a little hard upon him poor, forlorn boy that he was. But he seemed to have seen and learned so much within the last few days that he scarcely felt like a boy, but a man, until he went to bed at night. When I was a child, I used often to think how nice it would be to live in a little house all by my own self. A house built high up in a tree, or far away in the forest, a hallway, or halfway up a hillside, so delectously alone and independent, not a lesson to learn, but no. I always like learning my lessons. Anyway, anyhow, to choose the lessons I like best, to have as many books to read and dolls to play with as I ever wanted. Above all, to be free and at rest, with no one to tease or trouble or scold me, would be charming. For I was a lonely little thing, who liked quietness, as many children do, with other children, and sometimes grown-up people even, cannot understand. And so I understand Prince Dorla. After his first despair, he was not merely comfortable, but actually happy in his house of solitude. 
doing everything for himself and enjoying everything by himself until bedtime. Then he did not like it at all. No more, I suppose, than other children would like would have liked my imaginary house in a tree when they had all significant of their own company. But the prince had to bury it, and he did bury it, like a prince, for fully five days. All that time, he got up in the morning and went to bed at night without having spoken to a creature or indeed having heard a single sound. For even his little lark was silent. And as for his traveling cloak, cloak, either he never thought about it or else it would have spirited, spirited away. For he made no use of it, nor attempted to do so. A very strange assistant it was, those five lonely days. He never entirely forgot it. It threw him back upon himself and into himself in a way that all of us had to learn when we grow up. And there are the better for it, for it is somewhat hard learning. On the sixth day, Prince Dola had a strange composure in his look, but he was very grave and thin and white. He had nearly come to the end of his provisions. And what was to happen next? Get out of the tower? He could not. The light of the deaf mute youth was always carried away. And if it had not been, how could the poor boy have used it? And even if he slunk or flung himself down and by mysterious, my, by my, Mar Markerless chance came alive to the foot of the tower. How could he run away? Fate had been very hard on him, or so it seemed. He made up his mind to die. Not that he wished to die. On the contrary, there was a great deal that he wished to live to do. But if he must die, he must. Dying did not seem so very dreadful. Not even a lie quiet like his uncle, whom he had entirely forgotten now and never be so miserable or naughty anymore and escape all of those horrible things that he had seen going on outside the palace and that awful place which was called the world. It's a great deal here, said the poor little prince and collected all his pretty things around him, his favorite pictures, which he thought he could, he should like to have near him when he died. His books and toys. No, he has ceased to care for toys now. He only liked them because he had done so as a child. And there he sat, very calm and patient, like a king in his castle, waiting for the end. Still, I wish I had done something first, something worth doing. That someone might remember me by it, thought he. Suppose I had grown a man and had had work to do and people to care for and was so useful and busy that they liked me and perhaps even, even forgot I was lame. Then I would have been nice to live, I think. A, care, a tear came into the little fellow's eye, and he listened intensely through the dead silence for some hopeful sound. Was that one? Was it his little lark, whom he had almost forgotten? No, nothing half so sweet. But it really was something, something which came nearer and nearer, so that there was no mistaking it. It was the sound of the trumpet, one of the great civil trumpets so admired in no man's land. Not pleasant music, but very bald, grand, and aspiring. As he listened to it, the boy seemed to recall many things which had slipped his memory for years. And to nerve himself for whatever might be going to happen. And what happened was this. The poor condemned woman had not been a, such a wicked, wicked woman after all. Perhaps her courage was not wholly disinterested, but she had done a very heroic thing. As soon as she heard of the death and burial of the king, and of the changes that were taking place in the country, a daring idea came to her mind. To set up on the throne of no man land is rightful here. Thereupon she pursued it, she pursued the deaf mute to take her away with him. And they got up like the wind from city to city, spreading everywhere the news that Prince Darla's death and burial had been an, an invention <coughs> concluded by his wicked uncle. <coughs> that he was alive and well. <coughs> And the noblest young prince that he was born. It was a bold stroke, but it succeeded. The country, wearily perhaps to the late king's harsh rule, and yet glad to save itself from the honors. <coughs> save itself from the horrors of the last few days, and still farther horrors of no rule at all. Having no particular interest.
and the other young princes jumped at the ideal of this prince, who was the son of their late good king and the beloved queen Dorless. Hooray for Prince Dorlor. Let Prince Dorlor be our given serv 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 savior right from end to end of the kingdom. Everyone tries to remember what a dear baby he once was. How like his mother, who had been so sweet and kind, and his father, the finest looking king that ever resigned. No one remembers his lameness, or if they did, they passed it over as a matter of no consequences. They were determined to have him reign over them, boy as he was, perhaps just because he was a boy, since in that case, the great nobles thought they should be able to do as they liked with the country. According to the, with a fickleness, not confined to the people of no man's land, no sooner with the late king laid to his grave that they pronounced him to have been a usper, to all his family out of the palace, and left the empty for reception of the new savior, whom they went to fetch with great, great rejoicing. A select body of lords, gentlemen, and soldiers traveling night and day in solemn procrastination through the country until they reached Hopeless Tower. There they found the prince sitting calmly on the floor, deadly pale indeed, for he expected a quite different end from this, and was resolved if he had died to die courageously, like a prince and like a king. But when they hailed him as a prince and king, as explained to him how matters stood, and what stood, went down on their knees before him, Offering the crown on a velvet cushion with four golden castles, each nearly as big as his head, small though he was and lame, which lameness the counters pretended not to notice. There came such a glow into his face, such a dignity into his demeanor, that he became beautiful and king like. Yes, he said, if you desire it, I will be your king, and I will do my best to make my people happy. Then there arose from inside and outside the tower. Such a shout as never yet was heard outside the lonely plain. Prince Dorlos shrank a little from the de deafening sound. How should I be able to rule all, the, all this great people? You forgot, my lords, that I am only a little boy still. Not so very little was the respectful answer. We have searched in the records and found that your royal highness, your majesty, I mean, is 15 years old. So you ain't no baby. You can go out there and rule some shit, boy. <coughs> Am I, said Prince Dorla. And his first thought was thoughtfully childish pleasure that he should not have a birthday. With a whole nation to keep it. Then he remembered that his childish days was gone. He was a monarch now. Even his nurse, to whom the moment he saw her, he held out his hand, kissed it reversely, and called him summarily his majesty the king. A king must always be a king, I suppose, he said half sadly when the ceremonies was over. He had let him he had been left to himself for just ten minutes to put off his boy's clothes and reattired in magazine rolls. Before he could convey, convey before he was conveyed away from his tower to the royal palace. He could take nothing with him indeed. He soon saw that how impolite they spoke. They would not allow him to take anything. If she was to be their king, he must give up his old life forever. <coughs> so he looked with tender for well on his old books, old toys. The furniture he knew so well, and the familiar plane and all its loveliness. Ugly yet pleasant, simply because it was familiar. It was of new life in a new world, said he to himself. But I remember the old things still, in all... If before I go, I could but once see my dear old godmother. While he spoke, he laid himself down on the bed for a minute or two, rather tired with his grandeur and confused by the noise of the trumpets, which kept playing inst instantly down below. He glazed half sadly up to the skylight, whilst there came pouring a stream of sun rays, with innumerable notes, mutes floating there, like a bridge thrown between heaven and earth. Sliding down it, as if she had been made of air, came the little old woman in gray. So beautiful looked she, old as she was, that Prince Dolo was at first startled by the uh, apprehension. Then he held out his arms in eager delight. Oh, Godmother, you have not forsaken me. Not at all, my son. You may not have been 
me, you may not have seen me, but I've seen you many, many times. How? Oh, never mind. I can turn into anything I please, you know. And I have been a bearskin rug and a crystal goblet. And sometimes I've changed from inanimate to eminent nature. Put on feathers and made myself very comfortable as a bird. Ha, laughed the prince, a new light, a light, light breaking in upon him as he caught the infection of her tongue, lively and myster mysterious. Ha, 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 a lark, for instance, or a magpie, answered she, with a capital imitation of Mistress Mad, croaky voice. Do you suppose I was always sentimental and never funny? If anything makes you happy, gay, or grave, don't you think it is more than likely to come through your old godmother? I believe that, said the boy tenderly, holding out his arms. They clasped one another in a close embrace. Suddenly, Prince Dola looked up anxiously. You will not leave me now that I am king. Otherwise, I have rather not be king at all. Promise never to forsake me. The little woman laughed gaily. Forsake you? That is impossible. What is it just possible you may forsake me? But it is just possible you may forsake me. Not probable, though. Your mother never did, and she was a queen. The sweetest queen in the world was the lady, Dorazette. Tell me about her, said the boy eagerly. As I get older, I think I can understand more. Do tell me. Not now. You cannot hear me. You cannot hear me for the trumpets and the shouting. But when you are come to the palace, ask for a long, closed upper room, which looks out onto the beautiful mountains. Open it and take it for your own. Whenever you go there, you will always find me, and we will talk together about all sorts of things. And about my mother? The little old woman nodded and kept nodding and smiling to herself many times as the boy repeated over and over again the sweet words he had never known or understood. My mother, my mother. Now I must go, said she, and the trumpets blared louder and louder, and the shouts of the people showed that they would not endure any delay. Goodbye! Goodbye! Open the window, and out I fly. Prince Dolor repeated gaily the musical rhyme, but, the, well, but all the while tried to hold his godmother fast. Vain, vain for the moment, that a knocking was heard at his door. The sun went behind a cloud. The bright stream of dancing moots vanished, and the low old woman <coughs> with them. He knew not where. So Prince Dula quitted his tower, which he had entered so mournfully and ignominiously <coughs> as the little hopless baby carried into the death of his arms, quitted it as the great king of Norman's lands. The only thing he took away with him was something insignificant that none of the lords, <coughs> gentlemen and soldiers who escorted him with such tri triumphant splendor could possibly notice it. A tiny bundle, which he had found laying on the floor, just where the bridge the sunbeams had rested, and once he had pronounced upon it and thrust it secretly into his bosom, where it dwindled into such small proportions that it might have been taken for a mere chest comfort, a bitter fennel, or an old pocket handkerchief. It was his clever traveling cloak. Oh, I'm not even going to do it to y'all. We got one chapter love. And it's looking like the little boy went off and became a king. I'm so happy. Y'all know I got to end it with my kid book. Oh, dear God, what? How can I, dear God, how can I touch it? One day as Jesus was walking, a great crowd of people gathered around him. They wanted to see this man who had healed so many people as to hear what he had to say. In the middle of the big crowd was a woman who had been sick for 12 years and was able, unable to find a cure. She said to herself, I know if I could just touch Jesus' garment, I would be healed. She made up her mind and she was going to touch him. She pushed her way right through that crowd of people. When she got near Jesus, she stretched out her hand and she touched the hem of his garment. Jesus turned around and said, somebody touch me. And that big crowd, a lot of people were close to him. Suddenly Jesus stopped and turned to the crowd and said, someone touch my garment. 
Who was it? It was me. So right away, the woman came to Jesus and said, said it was me, Jesus. I touched your garment. Jesus looked at her and said, yes, you did. It was you. Then Jesus said to the woman, now go. Now you are healed because you believed and had great faith. Now go in peace. Dear God, yes, I can touch you. Yes, I can touch you with my faith. Okay, y'all. Y'all already know what to do. Hit that like, comment button. Hit that like, comment button. It, they're not the same button. Hit that like button. Leave a comment down below. Or hit that dislike button and still leave a comment down below. You know what I'm saying? I'm letting you know you can hate on me. You can hate on me. Hate on me. Hate on me. And you know or if you want to, you can love on me. Love on me. It don't really matter to us. And you can call us. If no, don't cuss at us. I say you can call us, but... Well, think about it. Uh, you already know a number. No, you don't. Just, just go in it tomorrow. Yeah, if you show up tomorrow, you'll learn it. But, you, but to show up tomorrow, you got to subscribe, hit that like button, and leave a comment. You know what I'm saying? And because I didn't get y'all video yesterday, I might get y'all another video. I might. I don't know. 